We're 20,000 leagues under the sea. Our name is Captain Nemo, and we're taking our ship, the Nautilus, on a big old adventure. But depending on what our motive is, we may be looking for different things like exploration, science, liberation, maybe even war. This is Nemo's War Ultimate Edition, which was designed by Christopher Taylor and Alan Emmerich and published by Tabletop Tycoon, who helped sponsor this video. Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Murphy of the Brothers Murph, and we are here with Board Game Geek. Well, I think it's time we drop below the surface to learn how to play Nemo's War. In Nemo's War, players will take on the role of Captain Nemo of the famed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. You will embark on his famous ship, the Nautilus, and you will be trying to score points based on what motive you decide to have for this game. You will battle ships, incite rebellions, find treasure, and a whole lot more. But before we get into all that, let's go over the setup. In Nemo's War Ultimate Edition, there are many different ways to play, mainly in the way of optional rules. For this rules teach, we'll just be teaching the standard game. In the rulebook, these yellow boxes are optional rules that you may implement if you want. There are also several blue boxes. These are difficulty levels. It is heavily suggested that you start on the sailor difficulty, so that's what we will teach. For the other difficulties, there are slight changes to the setup and a few rules. Okay, let's start. Place the board in the center of the table. You will then choose a motive for Captain Nemo. There are eight different motives that will all score differently and some have some special rules as well. For this game, we're going to choose the explore motive. Place the motive here on the board. Now we will set up the adventure deck. First take out the three act cards, all of the finale cards, the rising action card, and all five Nadim Dakar cards. The Nadim Dakar cards you will place back in the boxes we're not going to be playing with them. Shuffle the rest of the adventure cards thoroughly. Randomly take one finale card without looking at it and shuffle it with four random adventure cards. Place these cards face down in the draw pile spot here. Then take the rising action card and eight random adventure cards, shuffle them together and place them on top of the deck. Then place the Act 3 card on top of that. Take 8 more Adventure cards and place them on top of this with the Act 2 card on top. Lastly, place 6 more Adventure cards on top of this and place the Act 1 Prologue card on the very top. Take 25 extra Adventure cards and place them in the Adventure deck space here. Place a Treasure Gemstone on top of this deck. Place the Nemo, Crew, and Hull trackers on their respective rows here. Find the starting Nautilus upgrade card that matches your motive. Our motive is Explore, so we will gain the Hydro Drive upgrade card. Shuffle the rest of the upgrade cards and deal 4 face up next to the board here. Place the rest off to the side. Separate all the ship tiles into their respective colors. Note that each color group also has a letter in the bottom left here and you can sort by that. Place all 30 white ships and all 14 light yellow ships in the back and give it a good shuffle. Place the two black ships here. Place the four dark yellow, the four orange, and the seven red ships in their spaces here. Place the blue ships and the green ships on their spaces on the notoriety track. In a standard game, you will place them here, but we're playing a sailor game, so we will place them three spaces higher. Place two hidden ship tokens in the European seas, and then one hidden ship token in all other oceans like this. Place all of the treasure tokens in the treasure bag and give it a good shake. Place a treasure gemstone on each ocean with a pip value of 1 through 6. Note that the different colors of gems are just for variety, they all function exactly the same. Place the six character tiles below the board in your tableau. We're not playing with Nadim, so keep him in the box. Place the action point token on this space here and the notoriety token here. Place one black die on space 44 of the notoriety track. Give yourself two white dice and place the 10 uprising cubes in this box here. Place all other tokens off to the side within easy reach and that concludes the setup. In each round of Nemo's War, you'll be drawing the top card of the adventure deck. The game will end when you reach and resolve the finale card that we put in the deck, or if you lose in one of the defeat conditions. The very first card we will turn over will be the Act 1 Prologue card. This will instruct you to roll a die and place the Nautilus in the ocean that matches the pip value of that die. Say we rolled a 4, we would then start in the South Atlantic. The act cards you draw will be important for the second phase of each round, the placement phase, so we will circle back around to this card when we talk about that phase. When you draw an adventure card, it is pretty much always going to be some kind of event. Event cards come in three forms, test cards, play cards, and keep cards. Once you resolve the cards, they will usually have a green P or a red F. If you have the green P, that means the card will go into your pass pile here. If you end up with the red F, that means it will go into your fail pile here. The main difference is that cards in your pass pile will score at the end of the game, whereas the fail cards won't. When you draw a keep card, that card will go down into your tableau. These cards are often good, though they can be bad. Most of them will have some kind of condition that you will need to meet to fulfill them. For example, the at full steam card is a keep card. During the 
game, if you sink a warship in the North or South Atlantic, you will then put this card into your pass pile and it will score these adventure icons in the top left. If at the end of the game you haven't done this, it will go into your fail pile and it won't score you anything. Play and test cards will be resolved immediately when they're drawn. For play cards, you will follow the text on the right side and then usually the card will get placed into your pass or your fail pile, though occasionally you will get to keep them in your tableau. Test cards will also resolve immediately and they will make you resolve a test. Nemo's War revolves around taking tests, and almost all of your actions you do will require you to do them as well. A test is simply rolling two d6 dice and you always want to roll high. There are many ways to modify your dice rolls, and deciding when to do so and what resources to use is a massive part of the game and the strategy. Note that if you ever roll snake eyes, you automatically fail the test no matter how many dice roll modifiers you use. You can use dice roll modifiers on tests and there are a lot of different things that can modify your dice. We're going to go through the different variety of dice roll modifiers right now, but note you're not always allowed to use them all on every test. Each test will dictate which dice roll modifiers you are allowed to use, and note that you must choose whether or not to use a dice roll modifier before you roll. As we go through the various actions, I will mention which ones are allowed to be used. One of the main dice roll modifiers is using your ship resources. You have Nemo, the crew, and the hull. When a test allows you to use a ship resource, you will move the resource marker one half space to the right. This will give you a plus something, like a plus three here. This means that after you roll, you will add plus three to your roll. Using ship resources is great because they give you big modifiers, but they can be dangerous. If you pass your test, then the marker goes back one half step to the left and you didn't actually spend anything. However, if you failed your test, the tracker moves a half space to the right and you now lost one of that resource. You may have noticed that the modifiers get worse as you go down their rows, and if you ever get to the end of any of your ship resource rows, you immediately lose the game. So if you use them and pass, it's great. If you fail, it can be rough. And note that you lose only one ship resource on the sailor difficulty which we are playing. In a standard game, you usually lose two ship resources. Some tests will allow you to sacrifice your treasure tiles for dice roll modifiers. When you are allowed to do this, you will discard a treasure tile with a treasure victory point value, like 1 or 3, and the point value will be the dice roll modifier that you add to your roll. Treasures you spend on your modifiers will not score at the end of the game, so you're losing points for a bit of safety. There may also be some cards, like event cards or Nautilus upgrades that give you dice roll modifiers in certain situations like this armory card. Now those are all positive dice roll modifiers, but there are some negative ones as well. There are many tests that, if when you're doing them, there are any warships in the ocean that the Nautilus is in, you will get negative one to your dice roll. We'll talk about ships a little bit later, but for now, just know that all ships other than the white ships are warships. Okay, so that is how dice roll modifiers work. Like I said, they're very important, and deciding when it's worth it to use them is a huge part of the game. Now let's get back to the test cards. If you draw a test card, you will immediately take that test. So in the case of Jaws Wide Open, you will have to take a test, and you're trying to match or exceed the success value shown here, in this case, 8. Next to this shows what kind of dice roll modifiers you're able to use. A purple N means you can spend a Nemo resource, a brown C means you can spend a crew resource, and a blue H means means you can spend a whole resource. Note that if multiple are listed, you may spend all or none of those resources. When using ship resources as dice roll modifiers, no matter the test, you may only ever use one of each resource. You cannot move the tracker over three times to get a dice roll modifier of seven. After you roll, you will see what the outcome of your test was. If you roll equal to or greater than the test value, you pass. If you roll less, you fail. In the case of Jaws Wide Open, if you pass, you have a choice. You may either place that card in your pass pile, which will score you these symbols at the end of the game, or you may choose to put it in your fail pile to gain one Nemo resource. When you gain a ship resource, you will move that tracker one full space to the left. So in this instance, if we used a Nemo resource, the tracker would have gone back one half space to the left because we passed the test, and then if we choose to gain one Nemo with the reward, it would then move a whole one space to the left after it moved back for passing the test. If we choose this second option, we would not score this card at the end of the game because it would be placed into our fail pile. But gaining ship resources is huge. If we failed the test, we would lose one Nemo, which means it would move one full space to the right. Again, this would be on top of losing the resource if we had used it as a dice roll modifier. Okay, so those are the three kinds of event cards, and as you saw when we're setting up, there are a lot of different event cards and they all do different things. Just follow the text on the card and you'll do great. After the invent phase, we have the placement phase. This is where the act card will come into play. During the placement phase, we'll be placing new ships out into the various oceans, and we'll be determining how many actions we'll have in that round. 
How many ships you place will be determined by how many dice you roll, which is shown at the top of the card. As the acts progress, you will roll more dice. Right now, we're rolling two white dice. Once we roll them, we will then see how many actions we will have this round. This number is always the difference between the two white dice rolled. So if we rolled a five and a two, we're gonna have three actions this round. And we would move our action marker up three to signify this. We could have as many as five, or we could have zero if we rolled doubles. When you roll doubles, you will have what's called a lull turn, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Note that you'll be determining how many actions you get from the two white dice. As the game progresses, you'll be rolling more dice during this phase. When this happens, you will simply choose which two white dice will determine your action points. Now you will place hidden ship tokens for all of the dice you rolled, including the two you used to determine your action points. You will place a hidden ship token in the ocean zones that match the pip values on the dice starting with the lowest number. So right now we're rolling two dice and we rolled a one and a four. So we will place hidden ship tokens in this first ocean and then in the fourth one. If there are no more empty spaces in that ocean, then you must do the first possible item on this list in this order. First, you will see if you can place the hidden ship in an adjacent ocean of your choice that has an open space. Note that these dotted lines are considered to be adjacent during the placement phase, which is what we're in, but you may not move along these lines with the Nautilus during the action phase. If all adjacent spaces are full and you're unable to place the hidden ship token in an adjacent ocean zone, you will instead draw a ship token out of the bag and replace a hidden ship token with this ship. Note that this may be in the dies matching zone or any adjacent zone. Where you decide to place ships and how you fill out the board is an important part of the strategy. If the ship you drew is a white ship, which is a non-warship, place it with its white side up. If you pulled a yellow warship, place it with its yellow side up. At this point in the game, these are the only two colors of ship in the bag. If you're unable to place a ship due to all the spaces in this zone and all adjacent zones being full, you will then choose a white ship and flip it over to its gray side. This is now a warship. If you're unable to do this, you will draw a ship out of the bag and place it in any ocean zone that has a space free. If you place it in the ocean that the Nautilus is in, you must immediately fight that ship. We'll talk more about fighting ships a little bit later. If, after all of these checks, you are still not able to place a ship because every single space already has one, you immediately lose the game. A reminder that you will only do the first item on this list that you can, not all of them. Once you have resolved the placement phase for each of the dice you rolled, you will move on to the action phase. Here is where you'll spend your action points to take actions. Each action has a cost, shown on this table here, and you can take as many actions as you wish as long as you can afford them. When you do an action, move your action point marker down as many spaces as that action's cost. You may spend two action points to take an adventure action. You will draw the top card of the adventure deck here and choose whether or not you want to resolve the card. When doing this action, make sure you're drawing from the adventure deck and not the draw deck over here. If you choose to resolve the card, you will do so just as you do during the event phase. If you choose not to, you will place it at the bottom of the deck. When resolving a card during an adventure action, if there are any warships in your ocean zone, you have a dice roll modifier of negative one. Reminder that white ships are not warships. If you choose to resolve the card and there are any treasure gems on top of the deck, you will gain one treasure per gem and then you will discard the gems. Draw treasure tokens out of the bag and place them into your collected treasure box here. The next action we can do is to spend one action point to move the Nautilus one ocean zone. Though remember that for this game, we have the explorer motive and our starting upgrade was hydro drive. So we actually get to move two zones for one action. When moving, you will move along these lines here, remembering that the dotted lines are only used in the placement phase, not while moving. The next five actions, search, rest, repair, refit, and incite all use the action success table on the main board here. Many tests in the game are simply pass or fail, but these actions will determine the success of your test based on this table. And they will all have different things that you can use as dice roll modifiers, so make sure you're using the correct ones. While taking the search action, you must be in an ocean zone that has a treasure available gem. You will roll two dice as you do for every test, and you will compare your results to the search table. If you roll two or fewer, you will lose one crew and one hole. Three to six, you lose one crew or one hole. Seven to eight, you collect one treasure from the bag, but also gain one notoriety. Nine through 11, you gain one treasure. And a 12 and above, you gain two treasures. Under this table, it shows what the dice roll modifiers are for the search action. You gain negative one per revealed ship, warship or no, in that ocean. You may also exert one ship resource as a dice roll modifier, and this states that you gain a plus one if you have the arcane library upgrade card. Note that when doing tests that are on this table, anything in red is considered a failed test and green is considered to be passed. The rest action is how you gain your crew resource back. 
you will roll 2d6 per usual and then compare it to the table. When doing a rest action, you will gain negative one dice roll modifier if there are any present warships, and you may exert either a Nemo resource or a whole resource. Or you may discard a treasure token with a point value on it. You will add this point value as a dice roll modifier, in this case a plus two. Note that you may only spend one treasure as a dice roll modifier. The repair action is how you get your hull back. You test in the same way and you will compare your results to the repair table. The dice roll modifiers are the same as a rest action, but you may use one Nemo or one crew instead of hull. The next action is refit, and this is how you gain upgrades to the Nautilus. There will be a few upgrades off to the side of the board here. You will pay for these upgrades with sunken ships that you have taken to salvage. We'll talk about how you sink ships in the next section. The cost in salvage is on the top right of each card here. You will discard the ships off to the side and then bring the upgrade down into your tableau. When you gain an upgrade, do not bring a new one out. These are the upgrades that we have available for this game. There are a few game effects that bring out more, but for the most part, you have the ones you drew during setup and that's it. There are a lot of different upgrades and they all do different things, so I'm not going to explain each one here. But note that when you're looking through the rulebook, anytime you see something in one of these blue boxes, that explains a specific upgrade that pertains to that rule. The last action on this table is the incite action. This is you supporting and encouraging uprisings around the world. You take a test with 2d6 as always, and then your dice roll modifiers are exert one ship resource, treasure spent, and some upgrades that you may have. You get a negative one dice roll modifier per uprising cube in that ocean already, and negative one for each revealed ship in that ocean. If you pass, you will place an uprising cube in an open space in that ocean and then lower your notoriety. This is one of the main ways to get your notoriety down. The last action you may take is to attack a ship in your ocean zone. Battling the various ships is a constant part of the game. Most times you will be the one choosing to do the attacking, but sometimes you will be forced to attack a ship, like when you add a ship to your ocean zone during the placement phase or due to an event card. When attacking, you must declare a target and whether you're doing a stock attack or a bolt attack. You may target a revealed ship or a hidden ship token. If you target a hidden ship token, you will draw a ship out of the bag and place it in the hidden ship token's place, white side up for a non-warship, yellow side up for a warship. Note that as the game progresses, you'll be adding other ships to the bag. All of these other ships are warships and would place with their non-purple sides up. You place the ships with their stronger purple sides up if your notoriety is 36 or higher. We'll talk about notoriety in a bit. You will then battle the ship you targeted. When attacking warships, they will get a chance to attack you first. Non-warships don't attack you at all and you will skip directly to you attacking. Each warship has an attack value shown in the red star here. You will roll two dice and you want your roll to be equal to or higher than this number. If there are any other revealed warships in this ocean zone, you get a dice roll modifier of negative one to this roll. If you roll snake eyes, this is a disaster and you immediately roll 1d6 and the Nautilus takes that many hits. If you roll less than the attack value, you take as many hits as the lowest die value rolled, in this case two. If you rolled equal to or higher than the warship's attack value, the ship missed and you take no hits. The Nautilus takes hits in the following way. For every hit, you will roll a d6. On a roll of one, you will lose one Nemo resource. On a roll of two to three, you will lose one crew resource. And on a roll of four, five, or six, you will lose a whole resource. Note that when you're getting attacked, there are no positive dice roll modifiers, only the negative one if other warships are present. Each ship will have a defense value in the black circle here that you are trying to roll. You will roll 2d6 and your dice roll modifiers are thus. You will gain a plus one if you're doing a stock attack. You may exert one and only one ship resource of your choosing, and you get a negative one if there are any other warships present. If you roll snake eyes, it's a disaster. You immediately gain two notoriety and lose two ship resources of the kind that you exerted if you exerted any. If you did not reach the defense value, you gain one notoriety and you use one ship resource of the kind you exerted. If you meet or exceed its defense, the attack succeeds and the target is sunk. All ships only take one hit to sink. If the sunk ship has any notoriety symbols here, you will gain that much notoriety. And if it has any rewards in the bottom right, you will gain these now. Ships may also be worth victory points at the end of the game shown here. Blue for non-warships and red for warships. Remember that this scoring may be different depending on what motive you are playing. After a ship is sunk, you must immediately choose what to do with it. You may either let it sink to the bottom of the ocean as tonnage, or you may salvage it as scrap, which you'll remember is the currency to get more Nautilus upgrades. If you salvage, you will place the ship in an open space in the salvage area here. If this area is full, the ship must be taken as tonnage. Note that ships that are salvaged do not score their victory points at the end of the game. If you keep it as tonnage, you will add it to the space that corresponds to the ocean that it was sunk in. In this case, we're in the North Atlantic, so we will place it here. If you're in a transitional ocean, you may place the sunk ship in either of the adjacent oceans connected to that transitional ocean. 
at the end of the game, you will score points for having full columns of ships in this tonnage area. So you want to be sinking ships across the various oceans, not just in one or two. Now I mentioned that you have to declare whether you're making a stock attack or a bold attack. A stock attack gives you the plus one dice roll modifier when attacking, but you may only attack one ship. After a stock action is resolved, that action is over. But with a bold attack, if you successfully sink the ship, you may gain one notoriety to immediately attack another ship in the same ocean zone. Note that this extra attack does not cost you any more action points. And if you then sink that ship, you may gain another notoriety to attack another ship. You may continue doing this until you either destroy all ships in that ocean zone, fail to sink a ship, decide to salvage a ship instead of sink it for tonnage, or you just decide to stop. You can sink a lot of ships with one action point. So those are the various actions that you may take. Each round you may choose to keep one action point for the next round. This will add to the actions you gain from your placement phase roll. Note that you may only roll over one action point. Any others you decide not to use are lost. Keeping one action point is also useful if you end up having a lull turn. Remember that if when rolling the white dice during the placement phase you roll doubles, you will have a lull turn. Note that if you're rolling more than two dice during this phase, you get to choose which two dice to use, reducing the likelihood of a lull turn. Lull turns aren't all bad though, and you may even want to choose one. During the placement phase of a lull turn, you will only place out hidden ship tokens in the ocean zones of the white dice, not any black dice you roll. You will then place one treasure available gem in the ocean zone matching the doubles that you rolled. If there's already a gem there, place it in an adjacent zone of your choosing that doesn't have one. You will then place another gem on top of the adventure deck. At the end of the placement phase, you will check to see if the imperialist powers subdue any uprising around the world. For every ocean that has a land space with an uprising cube, you will add the number of cubes in that space, in this case one, with the number of revealed ships, in this case two, and then you will roll 1d6. If the rolled amount is greater than the sum of the cubes and the revealed ships, the imperialist powers fail to suppress the uprising and nothing happens. If the value rolled is less than the sum, you must choose. Either pull your support and remove one cube from a land space in that ocean, or continue your support of the uprising and gain notoriety equal to the value rolled. Once you have finished the placement phase during your lull turn, you move to actions. Unfortunately, we rolled double, so we can only do an action if we kept an action point from a previous round. This is one of the reasons why you might want to roll an action point over. If you did keep an action point, you may use it during this lull turn. All the actions work in exactly the same way, except the adventure, rest, repair, and refit actions all only cost one action point instead of the normal two. Once you have finished your action phase, whether in a normal or a lull turn, you will then go back to the event phase and continue playing. Before we talk about the end game, let's quickly go over a few other aspects of the game. We have mentioned the notoriety track a bunch of different times. Whenever you gain notoriety, you will move your marker up this track. When your notoriety reaches the blue or green ships, they will be immediately added to the ship bag. Note that these ships stay in the bag forever, even if your marker moves back below this space. If you reach notoriety level 36, all warships immediately flip to their purple, stronger sides, and any new ships drawn will be purple as well. If you reach level 44, you will then have to roll an additional black die during the placement phase, increasing the amount of ships coming out. You may have noticed that many spaces on this track say defeat. These spaces cause you to lose immediately if your notoriety reaches that level while playing that motive. For instance, we're playing the explorer motive, so we will lose if we reach level 36 notoriety. We're explorers, we're not supposed to be particularly notorious. Throughout the game, you may find yourself in some pretty bad situations, especially after you have a really bad roll in a critical test. You may remember us setting out our crew tiles during the beginning of the game. You may use these throughout the game as emergency resources. Each crew member will give you the benefit shown on their tile and then you will flip them over to their coffin side. It was an emergency and unfortunately one of your crew had to be sacrificed. Their abilities will give you action points or dice roll modifiers and some of these dice roll modifiers may even be used after the roll, one of the only times this is possible in the game. Some crew have a punishment for being sacrificed shown in the bottom right corner. For instance, using the first officer causes you to lose one Nemo resource. His first officer has been with him for years and losing her hurts Captain Nemo deeply. We have mentioned treasure a few times and using it for dice roll modifiers, but there's different kinds of treasures. Some treasures are just worth points at the end of the game or they can be used as modifiers. Treasures with a red X are immediately used. If a treasure has the word retain on it, you may keep it and discard it at a later time to do its ability. Or if you keep it until the end of the game, you will earn its treasure points. And some treasures are the wonders that you see in your journeys. 
As you progress through the game, you will move into Act 2 and eventually Act 3. Each act will make you roll more dice during the placement phase shown here on the card, and you will also follow the instructions on the right. During Act 2, you will add the dark yellow ships to the ship bag, then during Act 3, you will add the orange ships to the bag, then you may change Nemo's motive, or you may add one Nautilus upgrade that was set aside and not in the game to the Nautilus upgrade row. If you decide to change Nemo's motive, you must choose one of the other motives in its category. Adventure, Explore, Humanist, and Science are all in the noble category. War, piracy, anti-imperialist, and world order are in the stern category. Note that when changing motives, you may not choose to change a motive that would cause you to immediately lose due to your position on the notoriety track. For example, we could not change to the science motive if our notoriety was above 26. When we come across the rising action card that we put in the deck, you will follow the text on the right. This will cause us to discard red ships equal to the number of red defeat spaces we haven't yet reached on the notoriety track. You will then randomly select one from the stack and place it in your oceans zone and immediately stock attack it. The rest of the red ships are added to the ship bag. Eventually, as we progress through the game, we will draw our finale card, and this will bring us to our end game. Each finale card will have a specific story element that you will need to do to finish the game. Some require you to get to a certain area of the board, some require you to take immediate tests. You will follow the text on the card, and then when you complete the finale card, the game is over. We will then calculate our scores. When scoring, make sure to take the cards from the pass pile and go through them all carefully for their various symbols. And a reminder that cards in our fail pile do not score. Symbols may also be on your ship resources, treasure tiles, your crew tiles, and on various ships in your tonnage track. First, we will calculate our Scourge of the Seas score, which scores for the highest complete column of ships, in this case, 12. Then, we will gain one point per crew symbol. Now we will look at our motive for all of our other scoring. Our motive is Explore, and our scoring will reflect that. We will score all of our sunk warships. Each one is worth its points shown here, but since we're explorers, we subtract one from each warship sunk. Note that your score from each of these categories can't go below zero. Then we add up all of our non-warships that we sunk, which in this case are just their base value. Next, we count up our adventure symbols, which are also at their base value. Then, we calculate all of our treasure victory points, adding plus one to each treasure that has the treasure points symbol. Now, we have some multipliers. We will count all the liberation cubes we have out on land spaces and multiply them by three to get our liberation score. Then, we multiply the amount of science symbols we have by four to get our science score. And finally, we multiply the number of wonder symbols we have by a whopping seven to get our wonder score. We're explorers. We want to explore the world's most wonder places. Finally, you will look to see if you gain any negative points for the positions of your ship resource markers. And after all of that, you will have your score. Each motive has six epilogues, and you will read the one corresponding to your score to get your final story. And that is how to play Nemo's War. Nemo's War is all about management. You are managing the ships in the ocean and where to place them. You're keeping track of your ship resources and trying to keep everything from falling apart. And of course, you're managing your adventure according to your motive. And if Nemo's War seems like a game you'd be interested in, make sure to check it out to learn more. And until next time, I've been Nick Murphy, and that is how to play Nemo's War Ultimate Edition. Have a great day.